Okay, so now uh, we are going to uh, start uh, module number uh, two in the uh, third lecture, uh, which uh, I have written as a sheet deformation process uh, in general. Uh, it's called a sheet deformation process. We will see uh, several small small sections in this, which will be useful for our analysis uh, further. Okay, so uh, let us go to the uh, the basic introduction of this. Uh, the first one, what we are going to say is. Uh, in sheet deformation process, any process you pick up, okay, we are going to say that it is a plane stress process. Okay. So, when you say plane stress problem or plane stress process here, I have written, okay, it means that the stress perpendicular to the surface of the sheet is small. Okay. You have a sheet of 2 mm thickness, let us say, so along the thickness or perpendicular to the uh, sheet surface, uh, we are going to say that uh, you know the uh, stress is going to be very small as compared to the stresses in the plane of the sheet. Okay. So, we are going to assume this and this assumption, uh, we are going to follow it throughout this particular subject unless otherwise it is specified that it is not so. Okay. So, my assumption here is the normal stress which you are going to call this as normal stress is 0. Normal stress here means uh, along the sheet thickness or perpendicular to the sheet is 0. Okay, and this can be seen as a plane stress problem. In general, we are saying plane stress problem. So, what do you mean by that? It means that the contact pressure between the sheet and the tool is lower as compared to the yield strength of the material and that is why we are basically assuming this. The contact pressure, so you have a punch, let us say, okay, or a deep drawing tool, something, any, any tool, rigid body, okay, which is actually contacting the sheet and deforming it. So that contact pressure between the sheet and the tool is lower as compared to the yield strength of the material itself. So, we can uh, uh, you know assume that uh, it is a plane stress problem and uh, we are going to specify the directions now okay, in the next couple of slides and you will understand that the normal stress is 0 means actually what, okay, which one we are going to keep it as 0 and that is going to be same throughout this particular subject. So, let us go to the next uh, section, I am going to take again an example of uniaxial tension test, okay, which you already discussed in the previous chapter, how to calculate all the properties, you know, K, N, M, what is the effect of M, plastic strain ratio, everything. So, now uh, in this uh, schematic which I have drawn here, you will see that uh, this is the gauge region. Okay, when you do uniaxial tensile test, there is a sample dimension which I already mentioned. Now, we are going to focus only on the gauge region which is undergoing permanent deformation or plastic deformation. Okay. So, we are going to consider the initial gauge length as L. Okay. It has got a width W let us say and it has got an initial thickness uh, T. Okay. So, now we are going to deform it little bit okay. and uh, you will see the extended dimensions. Okay. There is a DL extension which is actually increasing in nature and accordingly there will be DW which means the width is actually reducing. You can see the red color one, the red color one is the new uh, dimensions of the sheet, the width is reduced and thickness also is slightly reduced. Okay. I have given dt here. Okay. So, dl is a change in length, dl is a change in, uh, dt is a change in thickness and dw is a change in width. And uh, this direction which I mentioned here are very important for us. We are going to consider this one along the length of the sample, okay, along l and two uh, which is along the width of the sample that is w okay, and three is along the thickness of the sheet. Okay. And thickness of the sheet, the what we are specifying is of the order of let us say maximum let us say 2 or 2.5 m, not more than that. By now, you might have, uh, have some idea what thickness we are speaking about from the problems we solved. We are speaking of this order. Okay. So, 1 is generally along the length of the sample, 2 is along the width and 3 is along the thickness direction. Okay. So, during deformation, the phases of the element, okay, for example, the gauge region, the uniaxial tensile test sample will remain perpendicular to each other which is called as principal element. Okay. So, now what we are going to do is though we have considered this as a gauge region, uh, mostly in this course or in the subject what we are going to see is uh, like uh, uh, you can assume that deformation is going to be in the principal element so that the calculations are actually little easy for us to understand. Okay. So, now in this also we are going to say that we are going to have something called as a principal element okay. and uh, you will see that if that is the case, then phases of that particular element will remain perpendicular to the each other, okay. which also means that there is no shear part of deformation associated with the element. There is no shear part of the deformation associated with the element. This makes the you know most of the calculations that we are going to do, derivations we are going to do uh, pretty simple in nature. Okay. So, in this context, I want uh, uh, to suggest that uh, one should uh, uh, look into 
uh, basic uh, you know strength of materials or solid mechanics course wherein uh, you can uh, you know one should know about uh, say for example what is stress tensor okay what are its uh, components okay what do you mean by normal stress what do you mean by shear stresses what do you mean by you know principal stresses principal directions how to find principal stress how to find principal directions okay all those things i think uh, you can read it from any uh, strength of materials book basic book or uh, any metal forming book i think you should be able to go through it a uh, brief idea will be given here then and there but otherwise we are entering into an element which is called principal element and there is no shear part of deformation associated with the element now having said that i am going to discuss something called as a principal strain increments okay principal strain increments so uh, when i am speaking about principal element i am going to term this as a principal strain increments and there are three principal strain increments one along axis one that is along length the other two is along width and in the thickness direction okay so along uh, the length which is defined by 1 so i am going to call d epsilon 1 that is dl by l that is the original definition which you have seen in the previous section and the width in the thickness direction in a similar way we can write dw by dw that is along 2 which is in the width direction that is d epsilon 2 and d epsilon 3 would be dt by t okay so one is uh, you know the strain principal strain increment along the length the other one is principal strain is along along the width the other one is principal strain increment along the thickness and uh, this thickness you know why is this strain principal strain increment uh, later on we are going to call this as a thickness strain which plays a vital role in deciding whether the sheet has undergone you know significant deformation or not okay which is going to tell us okay whether is there any localized deformation all those things those details will come later so these three principal strain increments are very important for us okay so now we are going to introduce the next small section this all are connected to each other which is called as a constant volume condition uh, in the previous problems you know calculations we already used this condition but we are uh, you know uh, defining here uh, you know uh, very officially okay so now uh, any uh, metal forming process which involves only plastic deformation then this condition is uh, valid okay so what we are going to say is with no change in volume during plastic deformation we are going to say that the differential of volume of the gauge region will remain as 0 which can be written as uh, d of l w t is equal to d of l not w not t not which will be equal to 0 where uh, this is what we said as you know uh, in the previous calculations we said as you know volume remains same before deformation at, and at any point of deformation okay so this equation can be written and this equation can also be modified in this way and a small calculation will do that dividing by l w t okay you will get dl by l plus dw by w plus dt by t will be equal to 0 which is what we defined in the previous slide as d epsilon 1 plus d epsilon 2 plus d epsilon 3 equal to 0 so which means that in any uh, deformation you pick up okay uh, in the previous calculations also if some of the problems also if you really look into the strains they are actually additional in nature and if you add it it should become equal to 0 and this condition is very important condition especially for those process which involves plastic deformation which has got no volume change okay thus for a constant volume of deformation the sum of principal strain increment is zero we are doing this and this will be helpful for us to uh, calculate several things in due course either for isotropic material or for anisotropic material okay thus for a constant volume deformation means plastic deformation the sum of principal strain increments d epsilon 1 plus 2 plus 3 will be equal to zero so here I am going to introduce okay um, you know something called as stress and strain ratios okay right now what we are discussing here I am specifically writing it as for isotropic materials mainly because later on we will briefly discuss about anisotropic sheets also okay until then whatever discussion we are going to make is for isotropic materials only and which means that as per our previous uh, you know discussion it is going to have identical properties are observed in all the directions okay with respect to sheets we are going to say it in terms of rolling direction and we can say r is equal to 1 what is r here r is nothing but your standard plastic strain ratio standard plastic strain ratio which we called as true width strain divided by true thickness strain as per our definition r is equal to true width strain divided by true thickness strain right so this will be equal to 1 we said for isotropic materials or not equal to 1 which means less than 1 or greater than 1 will lead to uh, anisotropic sheets or anisotropic materials 
Okay. This is the meaning of isotropic sheets and here we are going to decide or define something called as stress ratio and strain ratio okay, in the next slide probably. And this stress ratio and strain ratio are very important for the subject and that will the definition remains same one should remember throughout this particular subject which will be helpful for us. So, what is it we will see but before that because these sheets are isotropic in nature we are saying that by assuming symmetry in deformation we can say that the strain in the width and the thickness direction will be equal in magnitude. What does it mean? That means in a way I am saying that if r is equal to 1 I can say that true width strain will be equal to true thickness strain okay that is the meaning here okay. So, if I want to write it in terms of in terms of principal strain increments my width direction and thickness direction are nothing but 2 and 3 direction. So, I am going to write d epsilon 2 is equal to d epsilon 3 d epsilon 2 is equal to d epsilon 3 okay and uh, we are going to say that if these two are equal it is equal to minus half into d epsilon 1. How do we get it? We get it from this particular equation that is d epsilon 1 plus d epsilon 2 plus d epsilon 3 is equal to 0. So, how do you get it? Let us say for example, d epsilon 1, d epsilon 2 plus d epsilon 3 would be equal to 0. Then you will see that uh, you will have uh, let us say d epsilon 1 plus d epsilon 2 I am keeping and in place of d epsilon 3 I am keeping d epsilon 2 which will be equal to 0. So, d epsilon 1 plus 2 d epsilon 2 will be equal to 0 and this will give me d epsilon 1 is equal to minus 2 d epsilon 2 which is nothing but minus 1 by 2 d epsilon 1 which is nothing but your d epsilon 2 correct. So, d epsilon 2 will be equal to minus of 1 by 2 d epsilon 1. So, I can write d epsilon 2 is equal to d epsilon 3 is equal to minus 1 by 2 d epsilon 1. Okay. What does it mean here? What is the meaning of this? For an isotropic material or isotropic sheet, it could be aluminum or steel sheet whatever if you assume it to be isotropic in nature then you can say that the principal strain increments are related in this fashion okay, if you have any axial type of deformation. Okay. So, you will see that if you know d epsilon 1 which is nothing but your as per previous definition it is d l by uh, l. Okay. This is nothing but d l by l. So, if you know just d l by l okay, you can divide it by half and put minus here and these two strains can be calculated without knowing what is actually the new thickness and new width. So, without that this relationship will be able to identify what changes we have in uh, the principal strain increments with respect to one of the strain increments. Now, you will see that now I am going to put this condition like for example, during a tensile test for an isotropic material. Okay, suppose you have tensile test for an isotropic material which is done. Okay, then the strain increments and stresses can be in a combined way you can write it like this. So, how are we going to write like this? Your d epsilon 1 will be equal to d l by l that is the original definition there is no substitute for this. Okay. So, what is the meaning of d l? d l is a change in length divided by the original gauge length. If this is known then you can get d epsilon 2 by this relationship is equal to minus half into d epsilon 1 correct and d epsilon 3 is another principal strain increment which is equal to minus half into d epsilon 1. I mean previously we wrote this in terms of width that is fine, but now here we are rewriting it in terms of d epsilon 1. This also was written in terms of new thickness the definition is there, but with this particular relationship we are writing d epsilon 1 is equal to d l by l. If you know this you can calculate d epsilon 2 and d epsilon 3 in this way. This is uh, with respect to principal strain increment. Now, let us come to sigma 1, sigma 2, sigma 3. What are these? These are actually principal stresses. These are actually principal stresses. Okay. One should not get confused here. Okay. What is the meaning of uh, principal stress, normal stress, shear stresses? That is why I ask you to go back and refer your basic strength of materials course. So, whenever we write sigma 1, 2 and 3, it means that these are all principal components. Okay. So, if you want to have normal stresses and shear stresses, then you need to use uh, 1 1 2 2 sigma 1 1 sigma 2 2 sigma 3 3 or sigma 1 2 sigma 2 3 sigma 3 1. Okay. So, when we mention sigma 1 2 3 these are all principal stresses. Okay. So, now when you speak about uniaxial tensile test when you speak about uniaxial tensile test okay, straight away we can say that sigma 2 and sigma 3 are 0 why because it is uniaxial in nature and it will have sigma 1 only which is equal to p by a which we have defined well before. Right. So, and this when you say sigma 1 exists and 2 1 3 
does not exist, it becomes 0 is only up to the uh, uniform plastic deformation. Okay. So, once uh, you know your instability is started okay, or UTS is reached, then you have to be careful you cannot use this, you cannot use this. Okay. So, sigma 1 is equal to p by a will be there, sigma 2 0, sigma 3 0 when you have uniform plastic deformation until uniform plastic deformation. Okay. So, this will give some schematic Okay, if I got to tell this is basic schematic like you have a sheet with sheet thickness w thickness t and w as width and l is the uh, you know uh, your length let us say. So, now we are going to the, the next one. Okay. So, now you know the meaning of principal strain increments. Okay. We have a principal element and that is undergoing deformation like for example, a gauge length in uniaxial tensile test okay. and you can calculate the principal strain increments by d epsilon 1, 2 and 3 and if it is an isotropic material, okay, you can relate it in this fashion. Okay, d epsilon 2 is equal to d epsilon 3 is equal to minus 1 by 2 d epsilon 1 and if it is uniaxial tensile test, you can summarize okay, the uh, your sigma 1, sigma 2, sigma 3 and d epsilon 1, 2 and 3 in this fashion for an isotropic material. Okay. So, now these are all incremental principal uh, strains, okay. principal strain increments. right? So, now I want to integrate it to get epsilon 1, 2 and 3. Okay. When I am doing it, I will get true strains epsilon 1, 2 and 3. right? So, we have already defined this in the previous one more from materials point of view from Tencent's point of view. Okay. Here we are going to say that if you want to calculate true strains, okay, there are certain conditions that is applicable or you have to be a little bit careful whenever you post these conditions. Okay. What are this? The first one is the principal strain increments increase monotonically in the same direction. Okay. So, it means suppose if you pick up d epsilon 1, Okay. It increases positively and does not reverse. Okay. It increases positively and it does not reverse. It is called as increasing monotonically. Continuously it has to increase. Okay. That is one condition. The next one is the ratio of principal strain increments remains constant. Okay. So, what is it exactly we will see in the next slide. Okay. But right now we can say that the ratio of principal strain increments let us say d epsilon 2 divided by d epsilon 1 or epsilon 2 by epsilon 1 it is remaining constant and if you follow that then it is called as proportional loading. It is called as a proportional loading. So, this is monotonic, it has to be proportional loading. That means, I have written when. So, this is what is important from the onset of yielding to the peak load or start of diffuse snaking. That means, in the chain hardening region. So, you remember that sigma versus epsilon you have and you have a graph like this. right? So, you are picking up yield strength here, let us say sigma ys and let us pick up a point here, it is called UTS. So, in the strain hardening region, okay, we are saying that from the onset of yielding to peak load or start of diffuse snaking. Peak load means near to UTS, okay, diffuse snaking is going to start because instability has started and that is why we said that after UTS, you are going to have a reduction in stress, correct, flow stress. right? So, in this case, you are going to say that uh, this proportional loading is valid only in this region. After uh, you know your diffuse necking is started, necking started, we do not know what is going to happen. Let us keep it open for you know right now. So, that is the meaning. Okay. So, now here this principal directions are fixed, that is the third one. Principal directions are fixed. What does it mean? That means the material element which you are actually analyzing does not rotate with respect to principal directions. Okay. That means what? Your direction 1 is always along the length of the gauge region in the sample. That is why I am saying this. Uh, direction is very important for us. In the previous diagram, we made direction, is not it? Yeah. So, this 1 is always along the length, this 2 is along the width and 3 is along thickness. Okay. So, there is no rotation in the, in the material element. So, principal directions are fixed. So, when you satisfy all these 3 conditions, monotonic increase, proportional process and this one, the third condition okay, in the gauge region, we can integrate the strains okay, and we can get epsilon 1, epsilon 2 and epsilon 3 in this fashion. So, only when these conditions apply, the integrated strains can be calculated as this way in a very simple way and these are nothing but your epsilon 1, 2 and 3 and epsilon 1 is nothing but ln of L by L naught which you already used for some calculations, but right now we are defining it. Okay. And epsilon 2 is ln of W by W naught right? because this is where we are defining R. No? R is 2 which strain divided by true thickness strain we said and this is where we calculated ln of w by w naught, ln of t by t naught. Right? Same definitions are here, but right now we are putting this condition in this way. So, epsilon 2 is nothing but ln of w by w naught which is also equal to minus 1 by 2 into epsilon 1 as per the previous derivation and epsilon 3 is nothing but ln of t by t naught which is also equal to minus 1 by 2 into epsilon 1 which we have discussed in the previous slide.
okay so under these conditions you can integrate it and you can find out this uh, absolute strain values which we are going to call it as uh, calculating true strains okay so you have to be careful otherwise okay so if there is no monotonic increase if there is no proportional loading one has to see probably piece wise type you can get this uh, strains now we have seen uh, the uniaxial tensile test okay i am just writing uat uniaxial tensile test as an example and we introduced some basic things right so but the actual sheet deformation process are general in nature okay or general in nature okay so i am going to pick up a something called a general sheet process but though it is general it is not uniaxial we know but it can be considered as plain stress as per our first assumption made in this particular uh, you know module right so we are going to say that it is a plain stress now here since we have already uh, you know discussed what is sigma 1 sigma 2 3 1 2 3 directions which direction does it belong to okay then we can directly write this particular one uh, which will uh, make us to be a little bit clear about what is plain stress in this particular deformation so so uniaxial case you know what is it i just compared it here sigma sigma 1 is equal to p by a sigma 2 is equal to 0 sigma 3 is equal to 0 again until uniform plastic deformation okay when instability started it is not going to work then now if you go for general case in that case suppose you pick up plain stress okay plain stress means we are specifying mainly sheets that is why we are saying it as plain stress okay if it is a plate suppose 5 mm thick plate 6 mm, 6 mm thick plate means then you should not generally use plain stress one has to really look into it that's a different situation but then in general case if it is sheet we can say you are going to have sigma 1 you are going to have sigma 2 but sigma 3 can be 0 why because it is plain stress okay so we are simplifying the problem okay uh, any sheet forming problem as this way okay you are going to have sigma 1 you are going to have sigma 2 but sigma 3 can be 0 okay and sigma 3 again uh, you have to go back to your uh, the first diagram which i have shown here so sigma 3 means uh, the thickness direction sigma 3 is in thickness direction right so one is along a length and this fellow is along w right so you will see that now when you say plane stress means uh, it is sigma 3 equal to 0 so this particular one is very very important for us and we are going to use it throughout this particular course okay as long as it is the form of a sheet okay so now the story is all about sigma 1 and sigma 2 but you have epsilon 1 2 and 3 okay now all the relationships that we are going to have is between epsilon 1 epsilon 2 and epsilon 3 and sigma 1 sigma 2 sigma 3 will not come into picture because it is a 0 out of this epsilon 1 2 1 3 1 will become 0 later on okay in certain process that we will see later okay so now if we assume the conditions of proportional and monotonic deformation applicable to the tensile test then we can develop a simple theory of plastic deformation of sheet that is reasonably accurate okay so with this uh, you know brief i am going to define now what do you mean by your stress ratio and strain ratio which will be useful for us whatever i have given in the previous slide right uh, this particular one in the previous slide right sigma 1 sigma 2 sigma 3 for uniaxial plane stress general case but plane stress sigma 1 sigma 2 and sigma 3 this can be represented schematically like this okay tensile test so i have not drawn a rectangular strip or something like that i am just drawing in, in general only here you can see that okay this is a sheet okay so this is one direction so if it is tensile test i am going to have sigma 1 sigma 2 is going to be 0 sigma 3 is going to be 0 it is over but all three strains exist epsilon 1 will be there epsilon 2 will be there epsilon 3 will be there epsilon 1 you have to get it from the original dimensions and new dimension new length if that is known then epsilon 2 can be calculated in this way epsilon 3 can be calculated in this way how you got this we already derived it in the previous two previous slide so this is with respect to tensile test the same diagram if you want to utilize for plane stress there are some changes you have to look into it what is that sigma 1 will remain epsilon 1 also will remain right there is no question about it now sigma 2 will remain epsilon 2 will also be there what is it we will see now sigma 3 can be 0 why because it is plane stress and epsilon 3 will be existing okay so sigma 1 no question it is p by a sigma 3 is 0 let us forget it okay now you have sigma 2 so how do you get sigma 2 sigma 2 can be related to sigma 1 if i know sigma 1 as sigma 2 is equal to alpha into sigma 1 where this alpha is i am going to call it as stress ratio 
okay so i am going to call alpha as a stress ratio so this definition is very important for us throughout this course okay and uh, epsilon 2 how do i get it uh, for this if i know epsilon 1 is through beta okay so i am going to call this beta as a strain ratio beta as a strain ratio okay so what is alpha sigma 2 by sigma 1 what is beta epsilon 2 by epsilon 1 that's all so what is stress ratio it is alpha is equal to sigma 2 by sigma 1 okay what is beta that is strain ratio epsilon 2 by epsilon 1 1 2 directions are already decided in the previous to previous slide fine this is done now here sigma 3 0 fine how do you get epsilon 3 so epsilon 3 can be obtained from these two okay so epsilon 3 can be obtained from these two epsilon 1 plus 2 plus 3 can be kept as 0 okay because now principal incremental strains can be integrated let us say okay so now you will get epsilon 1 will remain let us see plus epsilon 2 is beta into epsilon 1 you can keep plus epsilon 3 we want to find out equal to 0 okay so now epsilon 3 would be equal to minus of epsilon 1 minus of beta into epsilon 1 so minus you will take it out will it come so it will be 1 plus beta into epsilon 1 so minus comes inside epsilon 1 will come minus will come epsilon 1 will come epsilon 3 will be equal to minus of 1 plus beta into epsilon 1 okay so see the differences sigma 1 sigma 2 uh, sigma 1 epsilon 1 will remain same sigma 1 epsilon 1 will be there which has to be obtained from original uh, you know relationship sigma 2 will become 0 because it is uniaxial here sigma 2 will be there and it is equal to alpha into sigma 1 here epsilon 2 is equal to minus 1 by 2 into epsilon 1 which you already derived in the previous one here we do not know okay so we are putting beta and epsilon 1 and thus that creates a definition of this sigma 3 is 0 here also sigma 3 is anyway 0 okay because it is plain stress epsilon 3 is equal to minus 1 by 2 into epsilon 1 here also we do not know what is that okay but from this relationship we are getting minus of 1 plus beta into epsilon 1 so if you know beta you will put substitute here and you can get epsilon 3 okay so this is what is summarized uh, okay here so uh, in general uh, that is plain stress okay so i can write epsilon 1 epsilon 2 is beta onto epsilon 1 and epsilon 3 is equal to minus of 1 plus beta onto epsilon 1 and uh, of course sigma 1 will be there sigma 2 will be equal to alpha onto sigma 1 and sigma 3 will be equal to 0 fine so now if you see that i can directly compare this fellow and this fellow and say that for uniaxial tension test beta is equal to minus half correct epsilon 2 is equal to minus 1 by 2 into epsilon 1, epsilon 2 is equal to beta into epsilon 1, so beta is equal to minus half for uniaxial tensile test, directly I am writing, okay. And here also, if I put beta is equal to, let us say, uh, minus 1 by 2, it is 1 by 2 minus epsilon 1 by 2, that I will get it here, not a problem. And uh, alpha is equal to 0, why? Because as per definition of alpha, it is um, sigma 2 by sigma 1, so sigma 2 here it is 0, so 0 by sigma 1 is 0, so alpha is equal to 0. So, this is the first important one, okay. So, what is alpha and beta for uniaxial tensile test means alpha is 0, beta is equal to minus 1 by 2. So, if you deform a material, okay, in uniaxial tensile test like this, what we have discussed until now, for this alpha is going to be 0 and if you get beta, it will be equal to minus 1 by 2, okay. Again, you are keeping an assumption that the material is isotropic in nature, okay. So this is for uniaxial. Now, now, like this, there are four or five other modes of deformation we will see in due course in, in other chapters, wherein we are going to uh, properly define what is beta and alpha for each one. How do you relate that? Okay, that we will see in due course. But right now, one answer is given that is alpha is equal to 0, beta is equal to minus half for uniaxial tension test. Now, so I am going to the next one that is called yielding in plane stress. So, with this, uh, uh, the brief you know, uh, you know, summary of what we can discuss about in general about uh, plastic deformation and how to get uh, uh, the, the difference between uniaxial tensile test and in comparison that with the plane stress or general deformation assuming plane stress, how to get, uh, you know, principal, uh, you know, strains epsilon 1, 2 and 3 and what is the relationship and then what is going to be sigma 1, 2 and 3 uh, in uniaxial and in uh, plane stress, what is the case we have seen. So, now we are going to introduce something called as yielding in plane stress. Okay, yielding in plane stress basically here in this chapter, uh, in this part, we are going to see small, small sections uh, which are going to finally lead us to something called as yield functions or yield theories.
Okay. So, what is the context now? So, I have given here some terms called yield surface and yield locus. One after another, we will know what is the meaning of that. But the context is this. Okay. So, you have uniaxial tensile test, for example, and a stress strain behavior is drawn here. I just drawn a simple you know, schematic. Huh? So, that is why you know it is clear, elastic part is so clearly seen, and then you have a plastic deformation part, okay, and then UTS happens, then you have uh, the necking is going to start here, let us say, and then it is going to fail. It is a typical process, and here we are mentioning something called as a sigma ys. Okay. So, how to find this yield strength is known to us. How to find this yield strength is known to us, right? So, you, you can use a proof stress method which we discussed before, and you can get this yield strength. So, once you get yield strength, it means that okay, for this material, if it crosses yield strength, then it may reach a plastic deformation which will start from here onwards. And before that, the material is going to be in the elasticity part. Okay. So, in that way, generally, uh, we decide that is why yield strength is going to be very, very important. The first time, uh, you know, when it crosses the yield strength, that is very, very important for us. And after that, of course, you can update that, you can update that, then it becomes a general flow stress. But when it is, this transition is going to happen is important for us. Now, the same concept in uniaxial tensile test, if you ask in general deformation, say for example, if it is in plane stress, general sheet deformation, but in plane stress, okay, where sigma 1, sigma 2 exists, sigma 3 is not there, okay, then how do you quantify this yielding? That is the question. Okay. So, for this, uh, just uh, you know, uh, very theoretically, we are explaining that suppose you have a square sheet. Okay, let us say this is a square sheet you have and you are deforming it in both the directions. You are pulling it in this direction. You have sigma 1 as well as sigma 2. Okay. In this case, you have only sigma 1. Right. In this case, you have sigma 1 and 2 which is nothing but a plane stress process. 3 does not exist, let us say. Okay. So, now depending on the proportion 2, 1, 1, you may have yielding that is going to happen at one particular stage of deformation. Correct. So, what I am going to do is very, very theoretically, I am saying loading and unloading a square sheet of material is done in two directions in any proportion. That is what the schematic tells you here, this particular one. Okay, this one direction, two direction. So, I am going to load, unload it. I will see whether there is permanent deformation or not. I am going to load and unload it. There is going to be permanent deformation or not. I am going to check it. So, that I know where is this elastic to plastic transition or uh, onset of yielding that will be there. Okay. So, for that, I will do some this kind of xi. Say, for example, okay, uh, let us take, I will uh, pick up sigma 2, I will increase it to sigma 1, let us say, some value okay, and generate, let us say, sigma 1, I am going to change. So, I am going to take sigma 2 by, uh, sigma 2 to sigma 2 dash and I am going to, uh, you know, calculate sigma 1 such that I am going to have elastic to plastic transition, elastic to plastic transition. Okay. So, like this. For example, I am just checking at point number 1, no, it is elastic, 2, elastic, 3, yes, 4, 5. But between 5 and 6 at one particular point, I will see that the elastic to plastic transition happens. So, I am just drawing this side is E and when it comes on this side, it is P. That means, uh, from here onwards, I am going to start having plastic deformation. So, I can pick up this as uh, my one yield point or yield strength. Okay. The same one, I am going to now repeat for several other values, let us say. I am going to take uh, then sigma 2 dash now. Now, I am going to convert that to sigma 2 double dash and I am going to increase sigma 1 such that I am going to find one elastic to plastic transition. That will also happen let us say between 5 and 6 or 6 and 7. I will get one more point. Okay. That also is schematically drawn like this. If it is between sigma 1 and sigma 2, I am picking up the sigma 2 to this particular value and I am increasing sigma 1 and I am increasing sigma 1. So, I am going to get one particular point okay, where between 5 and 6, I am going to have elastic to plastic transition like this. Similarly, I am going to sigma 2, I am going to take it to sigma 2 dash let us say and I am going to change sigma 1, I will get some other transition. Okay. So, like this for different proportions of sigma 1 and uh, let us say sigma 2, okay, practically we may get that is a question, but then theoretically one can get let us say at different uh, data points and I am going to draw all the data points between sigma 1 and sigma 2 in this fashion. Okay. So, I am going to draw it is like this. Suppose I get uh, one transition here, here, here data point all are basically this elastic to plastic transition. I do not know what this is. These all are elastic to plastic data points. Randomly, I am picking data points like this. Okay. Randomly, I am picking all such data points. For that means what? So, I am going to deform the material 
with this proportion, let us say sigma 2 by sigma 1 is decided. I am going to pick up this particular uh, proportional path and I am going to get one elastic to plastic junction that is this point. Similarly, this point, similarly, this point, similarly, this point, similarly, this point, like this. Okay. So, I am going to several other proportions, I am going to get many such data points which I have marked as into here, okay, randomly, okay, I am just drawing. Then I am going to use a, you know, some sort of a smooth curve I am going to draw and it looks like this, the red color one. Okay. And this is what we are going to call it as a yield locus, this is what we are going to call it as yield locus. So, I have just returned here, initial yield locus bracket indicates onset of a plastic deformation. Okay. What does it mean? That means, suppose if you pick up this particular stress path, okay. so if I pick up this particular data point, I am in elastic deformation. But when it reaches this particular locus, it means uh, plastic deformation is uh, started. Why? Because uh, I am going to reach the yield locus. I am going to reach the yield locus okay, if I follow this particular alpha. If I particular this alpha. Alpha is what? Sigma 2 by sigma 1. But if I follow this alpha, this is also another alpha, it will give another alpha sigma 2 by sigma, I may reach it here. If I follow this, I may reach here. Okay. So, it means that as long as sigma 1, sigma 2 are within this yield locus, I am not going to have yielding in the material, it will be in elastic part. Moment I reach the locus, it will be in plastic deformation. So, I am going to join all these data points in the form of a locus and we are going to call it as yield locus. And uh, this is called initial yield locus because that is the initial yielding that is going to happen. Okay. But we are going to deform it further. For example, I am going to, this point is reached, I am going to get this point, this point, this point, this point, this point up to UTS, let us say for example, which is equivalent to saying uh, that this red color curve locus has become this blue color curve or black color one. Okay. So, from here I am going to this particular one, which means that this point is going to become this point. Let us say this point and this point is going to become this point. Similarly, several points are there which can give me the next yield locus and I am going to call this as a subsequent yield locus. Okay. So, will it expand like this okay. or will it change its shape? Okay. All those things which we will discuss to some extent in later chapters, but otherwise let us assume that the shape of the yield locus remains same like this ellipse and it is going to increase its size due to strain hardening. Okay. So, flow stress here is less as compared to this, similarly here as compared to this. So, this is what is called as a, this term called as a yield locus. Okay. If you see that in the form of a three dimension, it will become a surface which I will give you example later on. Okay. So, now if you want to uh, you know define uh, you know or derive some equations for this, then they are called as yield theories or yield functions. It is called as yield theories okay, or we call it as yield functions. Fine. So, there are some introductory point here. Okay. So, yielding in plane stress actually depends on current hardness or strength of the sheet okay, and the stress ratio. Okay. So, in this context again a stress strain graph would be useful for you. Suppose, if this is a stress strain graph you are having, okay, let us say like this okay. and uh, let us say this is your sigma y s. Any value here we can call it as sigma f let us say and let us say for example, this is a particular strain. Okay. This is point and let us say uh, this point is also you can call this at particular one particular strain you are having this sigma f and this stress strain behavior you are getting because of one particular alpha one particular alpha. This alpha if it is 0, then it is uniaxial. If it is some other value, then you may have some other mode of deformation. Let us go ahead in this. Okay. So, yielding in plane stress depends on the current strength, correct. Okay. Because you, you need to know the current strength of the material when it is undergoing deformation, only then you can say whether it is less than yield strength or above yield strength. Okay. So, the current strength or flow stress sigma f is used to define the strength. That is why I call it as a sigma f. So, sigma f, the flow stress is the stress at which material will yield in simple tension that is alpha is equal to 0. So, when you keep alpha is equal to 0, okay, whenever it is first yielding, you can call it as sigma f okay. and after that, uh, you are going to have increased flow stress. Okay. The yield strength is a minimum required stress. After that, if you are further deforming it, you need larger flow stress to reach that particular strain. So, now, this is what I was telling you, sigma f depends on the amount of deformation to which the element has been subjected and it will change during the process. So, naturally, so the amount of deformation means strain. So, here you have one strain, let us say it is reached, 
after that you have another strain where there is different sigma f another strain another deformation so continuously sigma f is going to change depending on the amount of deformation that is in that process let us say consider only one instant let us say sigma f okay knowing alpha uh, knowing alpha okay you need to be able to find out what is sigma 1 sigma 2 to reach that particular sigma f that is the question now by knowing alpha okay and by knowing sigma f can we find out sigma 1 sigma 2 which causes that particular deformation okay so or uh, whether that sigma f uh, is actually uh, you are uh, reached you, you know you got yield strength or not okay or plastic flow will continue for a small deformation or not can be found out so now there are some important points that uh, we are going to discuss in in small uh, this one but then uh, uh, the basics of this i think you should understand more from material science point of view we will not go into details but these are all some basic things required for uh, you know to understand the nature of plastic deformation so if you want to define uh, yield theories okay so then that uh, the knowledge on nature of plastic deformation of metals is going to be important what is that these are all already you might have studied this but i'm just summarizing here so most of the metals that we are speaking about are polycrystalline in nature okay and here if you see the plastic flow occurs by slip on uh, crystal lattice planes okay when the shear stresses reaches a critical value right so uh, in a conventional you know polycrystalline materials that we are generally discussing like steel aluminum plastic flow or plastic deformation occurs by slip okay on lattice planes i think you understand the meaning of lattice planes okay when the shear stresses reaches a particular value as long as it is below the critical value plastic flow will not happen once it crosses plastic flow will happen okay so now when you speak about slip more mechanisms on this you can look into material science book but then the slip which is associated with the dislocations in the lattice is insensitive to normal stress on the slip planes okay so again here normal stress i want you to refresh it more from solid mechanics point of view you say normal stress and then shear stress okay so and this normal stresses are related to principal stresses okay when shear stresses are not there these are all certain things you should know so now what we are going to say this this yielding is influenced by shear stresses on the element and is not likely to be influenced by average stress or pressure okay suppose you are going to quantify something called an average stress or pressure the average of let us say principal uh, normal stresses let us say principal stresses then okay the, we are going to say that yielding is influenced only by the shear stresses and not likely to be influenced by that average stress or pressure okay so it is not going to be influenced but what is this average stress we will see now so in a way we are going to say that if you want yielding in polycrystalline materials then shear stresses are the main one which are responsible for that okay so now if you want to speak about shear stresses then there is something called as maximum shear stress okay again we are going to discuss about principal element only okay and this is a principal element let us say we generally element means we take it in the form of a cube okay and we say that sigma 1 sigma 2 sigma 3 are actually acting perpendicular to each phase and they are nothing but the principal stresses again 1 2 3 means principal stresses okay i have written as principal element here okay so now on the faces of principal element there are no shear stresses that's why i have written sigma 1 2 and 3 okay which are actually acting normally on the faces and then uh, there are no shear part in that but if you keep on looking at it there are some inclined faces at any angle where you will have both normal and shear stresses okay but in the inclined faces also if you keep on searching okay there will be uh, you know one particular uh, face okay on which uh, you know locally the shear stresses will reach maximum okay and they are represented in this figure 1 2 and 3 okay so uh, either you will have this plane where tau 1 is going to act you are going to have this plane tau 2 and tau 3 here and they are called as actually maximum shear stress planes and are shown in the figure so these planes will have are called as maximum shear stress planes so you keep on searching and you will pick up this inclined faces on which the shear stresses are maximum and these planes are generally 45 degree to the principal directions okay and maximum shear stresses can be found how tau 1 is generally written as uh, it depends on which stresses it is going to cut this plane actually cuts uh, 1 and 2 so you can write tau 1 is equal to sigma 1 minus 2 by 2 and then tau 2 actually cuts uh, 3 and 2 so you can write 2 minus 3 by 2 and tau 3 actually cuts 1 and 3 so you can write 3 minus 1 by 2 okay so uh, out of this uh, you know uh, shear stresses there are tau 1 tau 2 tau 3 which are actually maximum okay uh, shear stresses and three such values are found out in this way 
So now, in a very summarized way, we can say that the yielding would actually depend on the shear stresses in an element and the current value of flow stress. Okay, and we can say that f there is a function which depends on tau one, tau two, tau three, and uh, the flow stress. So this entire statement can be summarized one in one form. F is equal to f of tau one, tau two, tau three is equal to sigma f. So now what I am going to do is I am going to this part. Okay. So this part I am going to define something called as hydrostatic stress or mean stress. Okay. So hydrostatic stress is represented as sigma h. Sigma h is defined as sigma one plus two plus three divided by three. Sigma one two three are nothing but principal stresses. It's average of principal stresses. Okay, it's an average of principal stresses. What does that mean? It means three equal components acting in all the directions on the element. Okay, three equal components, that is sigma h, acting in all the directions on the element. Okay, and uh, it is nothing but sigma h is generally represented as minus p, which is compressive in nature in general. Okay, now the point is, this is like an average quantity of sigma one, sigma two, sigma three, and we are saying that this will not contribute to deformation in a material. That deforms at constant volume. For example, plastic deformation process. Okay, this sigma h, which is like an average quantity of sigma one, sigma two, sigma three principal stress, it will not play a any role. Okay, or contribution to a deformation in plastic deformation processes. Why it is so? You can explain it later, probably in the next class. Okay, so I will try to explain later in the chapter. Because of this, now what's going to happen is. We can remove that part from the principal stresses, and we are going to get one more part, and this is called as deviatoric stresses. So we are going to say that the sigma one, sigma two, sigma three can be divided into two components. One is only sigma h, which is not going to play any role in plastic deformation. Plus there is another part, sigma one dash, two dash, three dash, which are actually called as a deviatoric part. So uh, the standard stress tensor, which is defined by this, has got two parts. One is hydrostatic part, and the deviatoric part so which will lead to my next definition called as deviatoric stresses okay so what are deviatoric stresses these are actually the stress component after removing or reducing sigma h from the principal stresses they are called as deviatoric stresses that's what i have written it here so what i have drawn here is this minus this okay you are sigma 3 minus sigma h sigma 1 minus sigma h sigma 2 minus sigma h will give you sigma 1 dash Two dash and three dash, okay. So and these are actually called as deviatoric part or deviatoric stresses. Sigma one dash, two dash, three dash. Sigma one, two, and three principal stresses. Sigma H is nothing but hydrostatic stress. Sigma one dash, two dash, three dash are deviatoric stresses, okay. And deviatoric stresses can be obtained if you know principal stress and hydrostatic stress. Principal stresses, you know how to find out from a given stress tensor. Okay, that I want you to refresh from solid mechanics book. Again, I am saying, given a stress tensor, how to find principal stresses? One should know. Okay, there is a simple method to do that. Okay, and once you know, you know sigma one, two, one, three. Okay, and if you know that, you can get this. And if you remove the sigma h part from each one, sigma one, two, and three, you will get sigma one dash, two dash, and three dash. These are called as deviatoric stresses. Deviatoric stresses is the difference between principal stress and hydrostatic stress. So we can write sigma one dash each component. Sigma one dash equal to sigma one minus h. Sigma two dash is equal to sigma two minus h. Sigma three dash is equal to sigma three minus h. Now what I am going to do is I am no sigma h in terms of principal stresses. Just to simplify it, I will get sigma one dash is equal to sigma one minus sigma one plus two plus three divided by three. So you can take three here. Three sigma one. Minus sigma one plus sigma two plus sigma three divided by three, so that will become two sigma one minus sigma two minus sigma three. Similarly, sigma two dash can be written as sigma two dash is nothing but here I have written sigma two minus sigma h, which is nothing but sigma one plus two plus sigma three divided by three. So if you calculate it, you should get two sigma two minus sigma three minus sigma one divided by three. Similarly, sigma three dash can be found out. So this can be easily remembered. So sigma one dash means start with one. Two sigma one minus two minus three. Here two dash means start with two sigma two dash minus three minus one three dash means two sigma three minus sigma one minus sigma two. Fine. So this will also help you to solve the problems. Given a stress tensor, find principal stresses. Then you know how to get sigma h, or you can directly use this formula to get sigma one dash two dash three dash. Otherwise, you can use this formula to get sigma two one dash two dash and three dash, which will give you the principal stresses, deviatoric stresses, and the hydrostatic part. Strains you should get it from the original dimensions or the relationship between 
you know tensile test or any other form of deformation okay so now i am going to further simplify this equations for plain stress process which is what we want in this course okay for a plain stress process in terms of alpha i am going to what is alpha sigma 2 by sigma 1 is known now for plain stress process i will put sigma 3 is equal to 0 so what will happen now sigma 3 is 0 means in sigma 1 dash this fellow will go and sigma 2 dash this fellow will go and sigma 3 dash this entire fellow will go okay so now sigma 1 dash will be equal to 2 sigma 1 minus 2 by 3 sigma 2 dash is equal to 2 sigma 2 minus sigma 1 by 3 sigma 3 dash is equal to minus sigma 1 minus sigma 2 by 3 and now everything is in terms of sigma 1 sigma 2 and i can use this definition and i can write sigma 1 dash is equal to 2 minus alpha by 3 into sigma 1 sigma 2 dash is equal to 2 alpha minus 1 divided by 3 into sigma 1 sigma 3 dash is equal to minus of 1 plus alpha divided by 3 into sigma 1 okay i hope you are getting this point so for plain stress process sigma 3 i put a 0 which means this this will go this part will go and this part will go and i can rewrite remaining in terms of alpha so in fact you can also put sigma 2 by sigma 1 here and check whether you get a sigma 1 dash sigma 2 by sigma 1 and sigma 1 goes above so uh, you will get uh, 2 sigma 1 minus sigma 2 divided by 3 here also you put sigma 2 by sigma 1 2 sigma 1 sigma 1 will go 2 sigma 2 minus sigma 1 by 3 and here also you put uh, uh, sigma 2 by sigma 1 okay you will get this equation okay so what does it mean that means uh, how is the connection you see suppose if i know epsilon 1 right i can get uh, epsilon 2 Okay. Of course, I can also get epsilon 3, all 3 can be obtained from original dimensions, but if I know epsilon 1, all 3 we can get from original and new dimensions, but epsilon 1 is known, let us say for any axial type of deformation, then we can relate epsilon 2 to 1 and 3 to 1, right. So, in that way I can get epsilon 1, 2 and 3, okay. So, all can be obtained. If I know epsilon 1 and 2, of course, from this I can get beta, right. Let us assume that if there is any relationship between beta and alpha, I can get alpha also. We do not know what is the relationship, but we can derive. Okay. Then I can get alpha also. If I know alpha and I can get, if I know sigma 1, let us say, sigma 1 from original definition. If I know alpha, I can get sigma 2. Okay. Sigma 1 is known, let us say. Okay. And sigma 3 is anyway 0. Fine. So, sigma 1 is known, sigma 2 is known. Okay. From alpha, I can get sigma 2 if I know sigma 1. Okay. So, this is now understood. So, if I know sigma 1 and 2 okay, or if I know alpha, then I can get sigma 1 dash, 2 dash and 3 dash because alpha is known, sigma 1 is known, alpha is known, sigma 1 is known, alpha is known, sigma 1 is known. So, I can get sigma 1, 2 and 3 dash. Okay. So, because I know sigma 1, 2 and 3 here, okay, because I know sigma 1, 2 and 3 here, okay, so I can get sigma h also from this. So, if I know uh, then sigma h, then I can get uh, sigma 1 dash, 2 dash, 3 dash, this is another way to get, right. So, this is basically the connection, okay, when you deform a sheet, okay. So, these are all certain important terminologies and finally, we can say now with all the discussion, we can say that yield theory and plastic deformation can be described in terms of either maximum shear stresses or deviatoric stresses, okay maximum shear stresses which we have seen before and now we are saying that uh, since hydrostatic part is not going to play in the onset of plastic deformation, okay, we can say the, the other part is nothing but deviatoric part can be used to develop yield theories or any theories of plastic deformation. Okay. So, more details on this uh, we will see in the next lecture. Thank you.